I just hit the go button, so I'll take a minute. Yeah, it looks like it's working. Okay, thank you. All right, Dealey, I'm gonna, are you all set? I'm gonna yeah. get started. Yeah, okay. I'm ready. Great. Okay. Uh, okay, everyone. Um, good morning to everyone in the Americas and I guess good afternoon, evening in Africa, Europe, Asia. Um, again, thanks for joining us for another fine seminar. Uh, uh, my name is Lauren Hayes. I'm one of the co-hosts, and today I'm hosting the seminar series. I'm really glad that everyone's here. Uh, it's been quite a bit of fun to be doing this this semester. Um, before we begin, I wanted to just uh, welcome new people to find, um, those of you who are here for the first time, and just give you a little bit of background on what we've been doing and kind of some of our very uh, preliminary goals. Um, this was a seminar series that uh, Karsten Schraden conceived of, and um, it, it was a way to promote discussion about social evolution. And I think it's done, it's been really great. I mean, we've had some great seminars ranging from topics on um, mammalian social evolution, intersexual conflict in fishes, um, evolution of humans, and there has been wonderful discussion going on afterwards, and hopefully we'll have more today. Um, the, the seminar is co-hosted by myself and Eduardo Fernandez Duque at Yale University. Um, and uh, we, I, can, I think I can speak for the three of us. I think it's been a pleasure to be doing this. Um, the seminar series will go through mid-December. Uh, we plan to have talks on a range of topics of, revolving around sociality, on taxa ranging from ants to spiders to birds and more on mammals. Uh, we are indeed planning to have another round of fine. That's something that the three of us are going to talk about in the coming weeks. Uh, we don't have a structure yet, but hopefully folks will continue to participate in 2021. And we ask that you spread the word about fine. Um, I put up the uh, in the chat function. I put the Twitter and Instagram feed. If you use those forms of social media, could you please share the, the uh, spread the word about the seminar series? Um, and our, you know, the the um, the schedule is in the on the YouTube page, and if anyone needs it, I'd be happy to to share it with folks. Uh, just a quick note about uh, next week. Uh, next week we have Karen Stryer from the University of Wisconsin. She'll be talking about social evolution, behavioral flexibility in primates. So I hope people can come to that. Just a couple of reminders about the structure find for today. The seminar runs about 40, 45 minutes, and then it's followed by about an hour of discussion. Uh, during discussion, please, if you have questions, uh, if you're here with the people in Zoom, please type a question mark in the chat. Um, and I'll be monitoring that during the discussion and I'll call on you in the order in which the question marks were put in. If you're following us on YouTube and you have questions, please um, actually, write those questions in the chat within YouTube and someone will be monitoring that and then relay those uh, via the, the discussion board here in Zoom. Um, I ask that during the seminar, please make sure that your microphones are on mute. Uh, that way the speaker will be the only one who will be uh, heard on, particularly that's important on YouTube. And so that brings me to today's speaker who I'm very happy is uh, joining us and in the fine seminar series today. Uh, today, we're gonna to be healing, hearing from Dr. Delia Shelton. Uh, Delia is a, earned her PhD at Indiana University with Amelia Martins and Jeff Alberts as her co-advisors. And she had a really impressive um, record. Uh, she got a ton of funding for that. She had an NSF Graduate Research Fellowship uh, Program Award and also was supported by NSF IGERT. Uh, as a postdoc, she then had this really interesting postdoc funded by NSF where she was studying the social lives of zebrafish. And I found it interesting because it involved three institutions. Um, and yesterday we chatted about that as I got to know Delia a little bit. Um, and I, the coordination of that is impressive. She was working at the Leibniz Institute, University of Windsor and Oregon State. So trying to juggle three different labs working on a project and pretty impressive. 
And now she's, she's at Oregon State as an NIH uh, fellow. Her research interests uh, are pretty broad. They, and, and, and what I think uh, appealed to me when I was learning about her work was how she integrates sort of the multiple aspects of uh, behavioral ecology, thinking about collective behavior, social networks, and also more about development and in the interface between those things and things like ecotoxicology. So she thinks about how the environment influences relationships. Her focus has mostly been on zebrafish, which I think she'll be hearing about today, but she's also done some interesting work on mice. And we had some nice discussion about that yesterday about uh, developing thermoregulation in neonatal mice. And I wanted to highlight that her work on uh, the zebrafish has been very recently, as of, I think it was Friday, uh, was highlighted in an article in Nature. I put the, the link in the Twitter, in the um, chat feed there, um, which was really interesting and, and really nice to see that her work was highlighted in such a high profile journal. And I think another component of Delia's work that's really remarkable is her advocacy um, and outreach. She has a remarkable record of mentoring students um, and including the communities in which she works in her research. And so she's bringing the research to the communities. And so the, the science is, the science she's doing great, but then also the communities and are benefiting from her work. Uh, she's been really uh, involved in promoting opportunities for under individuals from upper underrepresented groups. Um, she actually coordinated the Charles H. Um, Turner program, which is an animal behavior society program to bring undergraduate students to the meetings. And she recently was an author, co-author on a paper that was published in Nature, Ecology and Evolution, entitled uh, Recreating Wakanda by Promoting Black Excellence in Ecology and Evolution, a paper that really has influenced my thinking and sort of how we think about the tenure and promotion process for new faculty. And so with that, um, today she's gonna to be giving a seminar. Uh, I love the title, Wild Tales of Finned Kin, Environmental, Environments Affect All Within. And so with that, I'll turn the seminar over to Delia and um, thank you for being here. Yes, um, thank you to the fine organizers and thank you, Lauren, for that warm <laughs> introduction. It's hard to believe that's me. Um, so let's see, um, I'm gonna share my screen now. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, we're going to, um, yeah, um, so I'm gonna, uh, this this photo from here is actually um, from the Nature article uh, that features uh, a lot of my field expeditions. And today I'm going to go into the wild and back again to examine how the physical environment influences uh, social behavior in wild and domestic zebrafish. Um, a phenomenon that has captured the attention of individuals is the movement of groups of animals. Vimit images of flocks of birds forming a V formation as they migrate to and from overwintering grounds shown here with a flock of geese against a sunset. You can also find such phenomenon on the ground as did uh, T.C. Snirla in uh, 1944. He described the death ant spiral where the ants continually follow the pheromone trail until they march and tire and die of exhaustion. One of my favorites is fish, which also show this phenomenon as depicted by the school of yellow tang. As people watch these groups move in unison, navigating their environments as a single organism, many questions arose. Are these groups stable or they experience high amounts of fission and fusion? Is there a single director behind the collective or are they operating under simple traffic rules, such as going right at the fork or left on their bridge? How cohesive does the group need to be to form, uh, um, to exhibit collective behavior? Do the groups have to be massive, such as starling flocks and herring schools that range in the tens of thousands? Or they, can they be uh, composed of a small number of individuals, such as a tight knit group of wolves uh, to exhibit this phenomenon? Much has been learned about uh, complexity or co collective behavior by examining the rules that govern the interactions of individual agents. Physicists and computer scientists have developed models using cognitive behavioral rules, such as alignment, uh, um, inter-individual orientation, attraction, pull towards other individuals and repulsion 
push um, from away from other individuals. To accurately predict spacing patterns of complex geometries of real animal groups, as we see in this death ant spiral. But we also know complex geometries can be generated by the physical environment. As we see the passageways of the embankment can lead wildebeest herds to form a torus-like formation. The effect of anthropogenic change on collectives, a largely physical change is an important pressing issue. So I'll focus on how the physical environment can influence collective behavior. So my work uh, integrates how simple environmental mechanisms shape complex behavior in animal groups. I study how the social and physical environment interact to influence phenotypes and placing some of the questions in the context of anthropogenic change. Within uh, this context, I've examined a broader array of consequences and identified simple physical mechanisms that underlie these outcomes. I use mouse huddles and zebrafish shoals to tackle these pressing issues. Although on the surface, they may seem to be very different species, which they are, there are commonalities that allow them to be powerful models for, for these exciting questions. One, both systems are model organisms. This distinction is rather arbitrary classification dubbed by the National Institutes of Health because these animals readily rely readily adapt to industrial and laboratory settings and their genomes have been sequenced, making the application of reductionistic techniques easily implemented. But here, rather than examining how lower levels of organization affect behavior, we'll explore how whole organisms interact and can be influenced by the environment or a few key individuals. Although I would like to, I cannot cover all these topics today, but I'll give examples that represent some of my newest and exciting areas of research. As you can see um, from the questions here today, um, I'm going to spend all my time uh, talking about zebrafish. Um, we'll first go into the wild while I'll present a study on the physical environment, um, how the physical environment is related to uh, different aspects of collective behavior in wild zebrafish. We'll then come back to the lab and examine how um, some of those environmental features um, influence wild and domestic zebrafish uh, behavior. And then I'll end by examining how a few contaminated individuals can affect the social behavior of the unexposed majority. So let's begin ex by examining how the physical environment is related to uh, collective behavior in wild zebrafish. So zebrafish have achieved this arbitrary status of model organism. Their small size, quick adjustment to uh, novel environments and presence of scientists has made them well suited for laboratory life. Their sequence genome and ability to regenerate fins, skins, hearts, and in larval stages, their brains make them a favorite uh, organism for uh, biomedical uh, research. I mean, we can light them up like Christmas trees. I mean, it's just pretty awesome. <laughs> but, but by comparison to the plethora of information we have on their genetics and neural architecture, we know very little about their behavior, especially their behavior in the natural environment. What we do know um, um, is from a little bit limited uh, published field observations is that as uh, zebrafish are found in small shoals of uh, two to 10 fish, our 2014 um, field expedition um, reported two to 300 fish, um, which at that time was the largest reported uh, groups documented in the literature. This recent uh, field expedition took it up to around 2000 fish. Um, and much of the work, when we were going to these different field sites um, in different parts of India, feel this idea to examine, um, I examine collective behavior because we saw immense variation in the social behavior. And thinking there, I thought uh, there must um, perhaps the vast toolkits developed by these neuroscientists and geneticists to manipulate them can allow them to be uh, laboratory models uh, to. That will, better, that will allow us to better understand the mechanisms under, underlying collective behavior. So um, we embarked on a field expedition to characterize the collectives. Um, 
And here's my wonderful, fantastic field team and some of the individuals that we met along the way. Uh, and I should say this uh, field expedition or expeditions have been part of a larger study where we've um, sampled uh, water chemistry measures, we've done morphometric analyses, looked at some of their sensory organisms, organs up close and uh, documented habitat structure. We've also done uh, quasi experimental studies where we've looked at um, networks, social networks of these, of these wild zebrafish. So where are zebrafish from? A question that a question that is probably really present in, in the minds, or not so present in the minds of people that study them in, in the lab. Um, so zebrafish are found in over 3,000 institutions around the world in 104 countries, as indicated by a 2013 report. Though we know a lot about the genetics and neural architecture, we know very little about their natural behavior. The hotspot for zebrafish is South Asia. Specimens have been found in India, Nepal, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and Myanmar. Today, I'm going to report findings on a recent field expedition, expedition in India, um, which is um, where, we do, where we've documented diversity in the social behavior. Uh, India is particularly a green spot for zebrafish. Uh, we sampled, uh, physical and social habitat measures at five different field sites. And the sites di differ, um, and I'm gonna talk about three of them. And the sites differ in uh, physical habitat, especially um, with regards to the presence of vegetation and water flow. Um, and so what I asked with these field sites is does, uh, water flow or vegetation influence, or is it related to collective behavior in wild zebrafish? And I look at this, um, their responses or uh, the zebrafish behavior in these different environments um, by examining the hallmarks of collective behavior. So looking at membership, um, leadership changes, um, group size, and uh, cohesion. And we're asking questions like, are these groups stable um, by looking at, uh, or do they experience high levels of fission fusion uh, by looking at, yeah, fission fusion in these groups. And then counting the number of um, frontal position, uh, number of times the frontal fish change gives us an idea of the leadership dynamics, and then looking at nearest neighbor distance um, by examining, uh, which allows us to examine shoal cohesion within these groups. And we can examine group size by taking photographs um, of these groups and videos to count the number of fish um, within the shoals. And what these three groups allow us to do, um, these three kind of field sites allow us to do is separate the influence of water flow and vegetation on collective behavior. Um, so we had three treatment groups and the, we had a, a vegetation control or water control, which had similar amount of vegetation as those um, in the vegetation and flow. And so um, a, lot, a lot of us identified whether vegetation was um, a salient factor that was related to the groups, uh, the, the behavior that we saw. And this um, control allowed us, had no flow, which is similar to this other, the blue field site, uh, which also had no flow. And so if those were similar, it allowed us to see that water flow um, might've been the salient environmental feature that was related to these hallmarks of collective behavior. And so, it allowed us to make these predictions. Um, that is, um, if the sites that had vegetation were similar, uh, then uh, in, uh, was the most salient feature, behavior would be similar in those sites and the ones without vegetation would differ. Whereas if water flow was the most salient feature influencing uh, these hallmarks or related to these hallmarks of collective behavior, then we'd expect those um, that were in still water to have 
uh, similar behavior and differ from those that had this really fast flowing uh, water. So what did we find? Oh, sorry. So, and then also if there was no relationship to any of these, we might see where they're all similar or all different. Um, and so what did we find um, when we looked at some of these hallmarks of collective behavior, specifically looking at fission fusion and leadership, um, we find a similar pattern. Um, that is um, those uh, groups and flowing water, um, these green groups, um, experience twice as many fusion, fission fusions and as those in uh, still water. We find that same pattern with the number of times the frontal fish change that, that those in these uh, flowing water experience two times as many frontal fish change as those in still water. So groups in the flowing water, uh, so what these tells us is that groups in the flowing water are more volatile than the groups in still water. And that uh, water flow is the most salient factor that's related to, uh, that, that we sampled that's related to these aspects of collective behavior. And then when we looked at um, show cohesion um, by looking at these nearest neighbor distances, we find um, that these groups in flowing water had nearest neighbor distances that were three times um, as small, at least three times as small as groups in the still water. So that these groups in still water are more cohesive, oh, sorry, these groups in flowing water are more cohesive than those larger, more loosely organized groups that are found in still water. So again, um, we're seeing that water flow is um, related to um, this aspect of collective behavior or cohesion. And then when we looked at group size, uh, again, we found um, some of the largest uh, shoals uh, that have been documented in, in the literature is up to 2,000 fish. And we found that in this, um, we found that in this uh, really fast flowing uh, water system, whereas in the still water, it was, um, uh, we found sh uh, shoal sizes that are about 10 fish per group, which is what had been documented previously in, in, in the literature and also reported in our previous field site findings. So again, these larger group sizes are found in flowing water um, when smaller group sizes are found in these still water. So what does this uh, tell us um, about our original question? Does water flow or vegetation uh, more related uh, to collective behavior in wild zebrafish. And you find for each of the hallmarks of collective behavior um, is that water flow is the most salient feature. And that the largest reported group, and we've documented the largest reported group of zebrafish in this flowing water. But you might think back and say, okay, well, is it actually water flow or could it be actually group size um, that is related to all of these other features of collective behavior, right? Because remember, we found that the largest group size was actually in this flowing water. So maybe group size is a predicting or um, yeah, a requirement for having these other aspects of collective behavior. So more lab experiments are in field observations are needed to really kind of tease out these um, aspects of collective behavior um, and trying to understand what is what is influencing it. And so I'll talk about some of this lab work um, where we bring field wild zebrafish back into the lab. But first, here's some um, wild zebrafish videos because I know y'all are dying to see them. So these are the um, large field sites and you can see um, these are zebrafish. Um, we captured them and um, to ensure that that's what they are, but you can see the shoals just go on and on and on and on down down the embankment. And um, we also have some underwater photographs of or, or video of the zebrafish, and you can see them here. Um, these are all on YouTube uh, that are associated with this most recent paper. So you can see wild zebrafish uh, swimming around, which is pretty doggone cool, if you ask me. Um, so yeah, so 
again, um, we took these fish and brought them into the lab um, to kind of tease out um, the effects of maybe group size and some of these environmental features on, on collective behavior. And so um, this work has uh, really been led by uh, Dr. Piamika Siriampola. Um, and uh, where we've asked, does vegetation or water flow affect shoal structure in the lab using wild and domestic zebrafish? Because again, there's this question of, uh, did, does their evolutionary history lead them to respond to these environmental features differently? So we got wild zebrafish um, that were in flowing and mixed vegetation. Um, they were from this really large group size uh, group. Um, and um, uh, with short nearest neighbor distances. And we used a lab strain uh, or a lab uh, strain or domesticated zebrafish, um, which tend to um, evolve or um, be bred in these kind of sterile environments that are lack, without vegetation and, and with, without flow and these really high density um, environments. And they still have similar um, nearest neighbor distances. And so what we did to tease out these effects of water flow and vegetation is we have four different treatment groups um, that had flow um, and vegetation, flow and vegetation and some would just flow alone and those that have vegetation and no flow and those that were just a, an empty tank um, without flow and without vegetation. We, track the behavior of these uh, zebrafish using uh, ethovision. And you can see our little flow um, generator there. And um, what we found, we did a number of behavioral metrics, but I'll just show you some about um, uh, shoal, shoal diameter. And we found that um, for wild zebrafish here on the left, we have, um, uh, in green, the ones that are flowing with plants and those with flow without plants. And then we have those that um, have no flow in plants and no flow in, in no plants. And what we find is that there's a main effect of water flow that um, those in flowing water have these large shoal diameters um, in wild zebrafish. And we find that same pattern in domestic uh, zebrafish as well. That they've got these. Um, uh, larger, um, larger shoal diameters in uh, the flowing condition and smaller shoal diameters in the no flow condition independent of the presence of vegetation. So this was really nice to see this similarity between wild and domestic zebrafish. And just um, putting them together again, just emphasizing bringing it home, you see this same pattern between wild and domestic zebrafish where they've got this larger um, shoal diameter in uh, flowing conditions and smaller shoal diameter in these still conditions. So in summary, does vegetation or water flow affect shoal structure in the lab uh, for wild and, um, wild and domesticated populations? We see yes, a resounding yes, that this water flow um, is, relate, is yeah, influencing um, these uh, aspect of collective behavior. It's just a shoal this long shoal diameter. And so another hallmark of collective behavior is um, coordination, right? It's this idea that they're all kind of um, polarized or got the same orientation and even spacing patterns. And so what we ask is, again, does water flow or group size, and, and in the field we had this distinction, was it group size or was it water flow that was influencing uh, these hallmarks of collective behavior such as orientation or alignment or, or leadership. So we brought these in the lab and we tested them um, in these large tanks. Um, and this tanks allowed us to not only film the fish in this compartment here, but adjust the water flow. So present them with water flows that we could find in the field. Um, and um, what we did is we presented different group sizes here and we assess uh, Rio taxis, which is an orientation um, in, in orientation in response to flow. 
And we presented with them with different uh, flow speeds. At low flow speeds, you can see that, or no flow speed, the fish kind of just move around. And that's what we saw in the still environments in the field. And then these fast flow speeds, you can see that all the fish are orienting in, in the same direction or uh, into the flow. And um, they've got kind of these more even spacing patterns. So we quantified that for different group sizes. Um, and we, um, group sizes and for different water flows. So we presented them with these really fast flow speed or this series of flow speeds um, that went from still all the way to higher. And we found, we um, assessed their orientation in response to flow. So show a positive reotaxis uh, response, at least three fish had to show um, orient in the same direction. And you find that as the flow speed increases, that um, they get all the way up to 100% responding. So they're increasing in their orientation, um, their polarity in the shoal. Then we assess the response of smaller group sizes. And we find, again, a similar pattern that as the flow water velocity increases, the they show more um, of this polarization of the of group. But you can see that the group with the smaller groups, the response is actually attenuated. The, these smaller shoals never make it up to um, as high response rate as the smaller groups. So group size interacts with water flow to affect this rheotaxis response or this polarization in the shoal. And so when we looked at this other uh, leadership aspect or the duration um, that uh, individual fish bit in the front for both these um, two and four group sizes of fish with these different water flows, we find that there's a tendency for the fish in the smaller groups um, to have a fish that spent more time leading than in the larger groups. Um, so uh, the tendency for the duration of leading also increases uh, with water flow. So um, there's kind of this main effect of group size and this increase, slight increase in, in leading um, with increases in water flow. So let's move on to the third aspect of my uh, talk where, uh, where uh, I examine how uh, contaminants or a few contaminated individuals can influence the behavior of the unexposed majority. So some individuals have an inordinately large effect on the response of the group. These individuals are sometimes called gatekeepers, super spreaders, or keystone individuals. In the literature, these individuals are often described as healthy. You might think of the alpha male and female of wolf packs and the matriarch of elephant herds. These individuals might direct group travel or be essential for mounting anti-predatory defense or responsible for the majority of disease spread. We also know that there is considerable variation in animal groups and not all individuals may be so healthy. There might be impaired um, by sickness or have sensory deficits or otherwise be um, deficient. So here we ask is if impaired individuals can be key. And we might expect impaired individuals to be key in collectives where individuals can come from diverse backgrounds, creating groups of mixed composition. For example, in fission fusion societies, migrating animal organizations, multi-generational groups, or animals experiencing seasonal changes. Zebrafish fit a number of these requirements as they vary in size and composition. Zebrafish are found in um, small and large animal groups and maintain um, highly cohesive shoals uh, with various social roles. Um, and you can identify key and non-key individuals. And those key individuals, and by providing these different key individuals with experiences, say through repetitive or reversive conditioning, um, and then placing um, key individuals and non-key individuals, experienced key individuals, non-key individuals back into the group and looking at the group's response, 
you can find that that changes the rate of learning. So those groups with experienced key individuals learn the task faster than those with uh, experienced non-key individuals in both appetitive and versive tasks. So these key individuals are having an, um, effects on uh, the learning of their group mates in ways that non-key uh, non individuals aren't, experienced non-key individuals aren't. So, uh, oh, I guess this is, so, so, um, Zebrafish um, are also native to India. And as India, um, yeah, so, so zebrafish um, are highly cohesive shoals. And as we've seen, they um, maintain these short nearest neighbor distances. And they're native to um, developing nations that are um, becoming industrial superpowers. And as they're, um, as they are becoming these um, superpowers, they are experiencing high heightened levels of, of contamination. And one of the contaminants that is increasing most rapidly is cadmium. And cadmium is uh, found, uh, cadmium is uh, a metal, a trace metal that you've are probably touched today. It's found in your cell phones. And you've probably eaten it. It's found in chocolate and, and grains, um, chocolate and grains. So you probably had some for breakfast. And cadmium is one of the most potent trace metals with, right, wi with widespread effects on the sensory um, systems at um, environmentally relevant concentrations. In fact, after seven weeks of cadmium consumption in water, um, cadmium fa was found in the eyes of rats and is linked to um, macular degeneration in humans. So cadmium can really ha affect your sensory systems. And so India is home to this wide network of lakes and streams depicted in this map in blue. This is especially the case during the monsoon season when floods connect multiple bodies of water, likely linking diverse populations of zebrafish, ones from pristine water and those from polluted waters. Also in these environments, uh, zebrafish, um, some individual zebrafish might vary in their susceptibility to contaminants. Um, as we see uh, that with human populations, some of them are just more susceptible to contaminants or things like COVID. So you also see these in animal populations as well. So what we ask with these uh, zebrafish is that um, establishing this phenomenon um, um, is that do these impaired or these cadmium exposed individuals have this disproportionate effect on the group. Um, then after that, um, we'll look at the mechanisms um, by um, understanding the, the phenomenon by examining the mechanisms, by examining the salient features of the shoal um, that might lead to this effect. And finally, I look at some of the ecological consequences of having these impaired individuals in the group. So let's start off. Um, to establish the phenomenon, we first ask, can these impaired individuals have a disproportionate effect on the group's response? And this work was um, done with uh, two undergraduates, uh, Zoe Austin and Anuj Kemka. Zoe's now actually um, in a PhD program at Indiana University and, and Anuj is working on a startup. So they're, they're just still doing great things. Um, so we had uh, 36 groups of previously familiar fish with six fish per group. From each group, we selected a pair of fish and exposed half the pairs to water. Uh, treatment and the others to cadmium to induce an impairment. Uh, through the, throughout the talk, I'll refer to shoals with cadmium pairs as cadmium or shoals that are um, shoals that are with water treated fish as water or control shoals. And so um, after we selected those fish and exposed them, we then presented the shoals with treated fish with the multimodal stimulus and assessed the proportion of fish on the stimulus side. 
And what we found is that the group with the cadmium fish approached the stimulus more than the control group. Um, so 80% of the cadmium exposed shoal or shoals with cat, the cadmium shoals were on the same side as the stimulus, whereas the water shoals were at chance levels. So the presence of these uh, cadmium exposed fish strongly uh, predicts approaching this, uh, this multimodal stimulus. So we've established a phenomenon. Individuals can be made key um, with an impairment or being contaminated. And now that we've established a phenomenon, we are a hot pursuit of identifying the mechanisms underlying the effect. We first examined the, um, examined, uh, the response of the pairs. We dissected the shoals and looked at, well, is it the pairs, these cadmium exposed fish in these, uh, that's leading to driving this uh, difference in the groups? So we dissected our shoals and we found something surprising that the pairs of fish did not alter their behavior in response to the stimulus. In both treatment conditions, the proportion of fish on the same side of, of this uh, multimodal stimulus were at chance levels. If we place the group data next to the pair data, we know there's something quite remarkable. The effect is hidden in the pairs and revealed in the larger context of the group. So we next examined shoal cohesion because we know from the work by Partridge and Pitcher in the 1980s that sensory systems are crucial for, for schooling behavior and thus disrupting them as was expected by cadmium um, would likely alter shoal cohesion. To assess shoal cohesion, we use individual and group measures. And what we find surprisingly is that Typical of zebrafish that both the cadmium fish and the water treated fish maintain short nearest neighbor distances and the shoals have similar shoal dimensions. Thus, cadmium water shoals are equally cohesive. So we thought, um, well, maybe they're different in activity. And so it's just that the cadmium shoals are moving slower than the water shoals. So Dolores and Sonia, um, uh, interned with me for a summer and they assessed um, they assessed all these line crossings of the zebrafish to get an idea of the activity um, of these animals. Um, and we found that in the pair condition that there was again no difference in the activity of the of these cadmium and control fish. And we found similar in the group condition. So independent of, um, um, independent of treatment condition, fish showed similar levels of activity in both um, the pair and the group condition. So we started um, scratching, scratching our heads like, okay, um, uh, what's going on? Um, is cadmium really, maybe our low concentration of environmentally relevant cadmium is, was so short that it just didn't have an effect or um, effect this, um, that we thought they would have. So we got straight to the point and decided to assess um, visual activity of these zebrafish to see if our treated fish were indeed expressing this sensory impairment as suggested by the cadmium literature. And um, I worked with uh, the Lawrence site on this optimotor assay, which is a visual uh, QED assay where you have a rotating drum um, of gratings of black and white bars. And if the fish um, can see um, the bars, they'll follow it in a circular motion. And if the fish cannot see it, they'll kind of sit there like that. So, um, uh, so um, we scored the responses of fish as responding or not. Um, we found that, um, that with both the water and cadmium treated fish, that as the spatial frequencies increased, as the spatial frequencies increased, the fish showing a positive response decreased. The difference between the cadmium and water fish uh, 
increase with increasing spatial frequency with up to 40% difference between the treatments at the second fastest spatial frequency at which they responded. Thus, we confirm that our cadmium exposure treatment is affecting the fish. Okay, and we know that sensory systems are the gateway for interactions with the physical and social environments. The widespread sensory impairments induced by cadmium may, may lead the fish to interact differently um, with things such as the novel stimulus and potentially with each other. And so we know that zebrafish are actively social. Zebrafish move around each other. They also show things like advances where one fish will move rapidly towards a stationary fish. They show chases where one fish will move towards a fleeing fish and they show mouth contacts or bites where one fish will put their snout in direct contact with the body of another fish. And we quantified these for our shoal and pear groups. And we find that cadmium fish show more advances than the controls and that cadmium fish also show more chases and mouth contacts than control groups. Overall, the cadmium pairs and shoals are more socially investigative than control pairs and shoals. And we wanted to know, again, di really dissect these shoals and um, find out who's actually doing this. So I worked with, um, so is it the cadmium ones or is it the water ones? It's, are they female or are they male? So I worked with um, Jeff Kelly, uh, he said, and Myra Bauer is in a Halima, uh, it's also uh, grad and undergrad students um, who are, uh, who, who did this painstakingly task at looking at our fin clip zebra fish and creating network analyses for these. So each fish got a separate color, so one through six, um, and they identified, they created directed networks. So identified the initiator, who's, who's actually initiating the chase and who's the target of the chase. We then overlaid that information with network layers, three network layers actually. So whether they were, uh, chemical treatment were, whether they were a cadmium shoal or water control shoal, whether they were actually directly exposed, you know, just the pairs of fish that were directly exposed, or they were um, uh, indirectly exposed. So the, the directly exposed ones are in the green and, um, and the direct ones are, are in the yellow. And then we overlaid that with sex. So we knew um, the identity of the fish. So you can see some, there's some females there um, in males. And we quantified these networks. Um, and um, what we found is that tanks with cadmium exposed fish had um, more chases than the water exposed fish. And that the and that the increase in chases with cadmium tanks were among the exposed majority rather than the directly exposed individuals. Sorry, I should just orient you uh, to the figure here is that we have the exposed. So um, these are either, um, these are the directly exposed individuals to either cadmium in green or water or control in blue. And these are the majority. Um, so we just selected random, um, individuals uh, from, from that group, and this is the majority. So the, they're not directly exposed. These are the indirectly exposed individuals for the cadmium and the water. And you can see our, our sexes, so females and males, and um, whether or not they initiated these chases. So again, overall, we found that um, the tanks with the cadmium exposed fish had more chases the, and tanks with water exposed fish and that the increase in chases within the cadmium tank was ex among the exposed majority rather than the direct, directly exposed individuals. Further analysis showed that female zebrafish exposed with these cadmium exposed fish initiated more chases than the exposed males. As we see, as well as exposed females in the water chemical condition. And next we looked at uh, chases received. So um, in, in the water, uh, again, it's the same orientation of the figure where we have cadmium in blue and the water in green, and we have those that are exposed on the left 
panel and those unexposed, the indirectly um, uh, exposed individuals are on the right and um, tabulated their chases um, received. We found in the water condition, uh, exposed females receive fewer chases um, than males. However, in the cadmium condition, the sex difference was not present. Female fish that were exposed to cadmium received more chases than the water exposed females, but, not, but did not differ significantly from the exposed males. All male fish received a similar number of chases. And so what this shows is that this cadmium exposure increases uh, received chases in females. So when we plotted out their networks for um, uh, for the cadmium shoals uh, and for our control water shoals, uh, this is what a sample network looked like. And uh, just to orient you, because there's again many layers to this network, we have the um, the exposed individuals. So again, these are the directly exposed individuals to either cadmium or, or water in green and the unexposed individuals. So the unexposed majority, there's four fish here are in blue. Then we um, have their sexes um, by their shape. So females are in circles and males are in squares. And the strength or the number of uh, number of chases initiated uh, is uh, designated by the thickness of the line. So um, as the line gets thicker, that's increasing number of initiations. And what we found is that there wasn't a significant difference um, in the network position by, by any of the factors, um, any of these three factors. Um, so, uh, the social network connectivity or position of individuals, um, there wasn't a significant difference for that. Um, so this suggests that the existing social connections between individuals within this network are strengthened but not disrupted by the presence of the cadmium exposed uh, individuals. And so in summary, we find that there's a sex dependent social effects of cadmium. Contaminated zebrafish can be key individuals and produce behavioral changes in an unexposed maturity. And then this cadmium induced network changes are mediated by these female zebrafish. And cadmium produces a sex dependent effect on, on group social interactions. And um, just from the human literature, this is quite interesting because um, cadmium um, has uh, stronger effects on female humans than uh, male humans. Um, it has to do with uh, calcium. Um, but so there, there's so, something going on with how these presence of, of cadmium individuals is um, influencing female, female behavior more strongly. So just to briefly summarize the results, we found that impaired fish had a disproportionate effect on the group's response. We found that the effects um, might be driven by, um, uh, so, so we found like, yeah, that these um, impaired fish, um, it, that these effects might be driven by attention to this multimodal uh, stimulus. Um, so, what, what these fish, what we think is going on, um, just trying to put this all together, is that um, I've pasted a picture of the parent group responses in the corner and um, is that, uh, remember uh, the cadmium affects all the sensory systems um, and it's expected that the fish in pairs either detected the stimulus or not, resulting in a 50% response uh, side on the stimulus. Those who detected this by the stimulus remained on this uh, stimulus side. Um, and in the mixed groups, um, the normal fish were able to detect the stimulus. Um, it's likely that these these fish, these normal seeing fish facilitated exploration, um, oh, sorry, ex um, exploration of the sensory systems um, um, because the cadmium exposed fish um, 
had lower sensory acuity, they had to come closer to it. It's like they didn't have their glasses on. Um, and zebrafish maintain these short nearest neighbor distances, keeping everyone uh, together. So um, why do the deficient and control shoals differ? So what's going on is that um, this, um, these zebrafish are highly interactive and um, you see this um, effect on their social behavior, right? So they're um, highly exploratory. So you might expect that this cadmium exposure might affect other things that they um, explore, um, such as food, um, predator inspection, or even aspects of their, their habitat. So um, next I examine how um, presence of these cadmium um, pairs influence um, the response to, to habitat, specifically looking at um, their activity um, and presence of landmarks in their landmarks. So um, we had these fish in these tanks and you can see these four landmarks and then we did a heat map of their activity. So higher levels of activity um, are uh, go from blue to red and you can see that there's um, overall uh, changes in the activity from the cadmium and water groups. But it just it's, um, but when you quantify that, it's actually that they have overall a similar level of activity. It's just where they are active in relation to the landmarks. So the, zebra, the cadmium exposed groups are more active near these landmarks. So they're exploring these landmarks, these, these artificial plants more. They, they have a closer proximity to the plants than these control groups. So just in summary, individuals can be made key with an impairment and social context is, um, is influencing uh, the behavior. The impaired individuals can have an internally large effect on the group's response. Further says, suggests that um, as we didn't see the response in the individual condition, but only in larger context of the majority, that the social context is important for shaping the expression of the behavior. It's not even all or most of the fish needed to be exposed to the contaminant to yield a whole group level change in behavior. Most remarkably and quite scary, um, the pollutants had a, have an indirect effects. Their influence can be hidden in pairs and revealed in the larger context of the group. The implications of this effect is that contaminating a small fraction of the group can lead to cataclysmic cascades for the group. The negative effects can potentially resonate in populations, species, and even whole ecosystems. Perhaps impaired individuals are leading to beaching in whales or calling it collapse in bees in the formation of cults. Oh, sorry. Um, I shouldn't have said that. Um, <laughs> um, the, uh, the hor horrific effects can be magnified when the species itself is a keystone. For example, bees can be keystone pollinators. Um, a major force in ensuring continued plant and crop formation, uh, crop production, removing them has had major effects on agriculture and their effects for the ecosystem has yet to be fully realized. What if there are no bees? Would the plants be barren or the ecosystem? Um, yeah, just a reflection of the cells, of themselves. The loss of bees has had major, major effects on agriculture and their effects um, for other ecosystems has yet to be fully realized. Um, so just in summary, if you have just two take home points that simple environmental features can shape complex behavior and that anthropogenic change, especially contaminants can have profound effects on the group. And that some individuals can, water flow can be a powerful modulator of group responses and that some individuals can have inordinately large effects on the groups. And these environmental contaminants can have indirect, indirect effects on group behavior. So some of the things I'm looking to do in the future is um, looking at zebrafish as wild sentinels. Again, using their vast biomedical toolkit, actually using them as biological monitors in the field as um, next to the people um, where they're found. And then um, 
again, dissecting more of these mechanisms of collective behavior and looking at the evolution of collective behavior. Working with uh, Roger Manikin, he's identified 27 populations of zebrafish um, and we have them. He's got like this personal museum where we're looking at sensory trade-offs across these fish and then characterizing more of these collectives. Um, so I trying to tease apart what are these, um, what are these, um, what are these characteristics of, of key individuals? Um, and then um, I'd like to thank all of these people here as well as my um, funding sources. Um, yeah, and you for your attention. So thank you. Hey, thank you, Delia, for really interesting, fascinating talk. Um, uh, this time, it's uh, we have plenty of time for asking questions. Um, just a reminder, uh, please put a question mark into the uh, chat and I'll call on you. Um, and for those of you on YouTube who might be watching, uh, we have someone who will put questions in. And so we'll get started. Uh, first question comes from Carson Schraden. Yes, hello, I'm Carsten Schraden from the CNRS in Strasbourg working on striped mice. Thank you for a fascinating talk, which showed me that I know very little about zebra fish. So I have two um, very basic questions to help me to understand, understand it better about the, the life history. From what I know, zebra fish, they don't show any parental care, which is why they're a good model. The schools you're talking about, do they only consist of adults and how are they formed? When do the fry or the young fish join the school? So they always make new ones would be my first question. And the second one is related to your result that in flowing waters, the skulls are much bigger than in still waters. Um, how does it look here about population density? Is population density the same in these habitats or can it be that there's simply higher population density in some habitats that are flowing waters because there's more food and then um, of course you need bigger groups? Yeah, yeah, those are those are great questions. So um, I'll go back to your, you might have to remind me. <laughs> so your first question was um, about parental care of these zebrafish and the composition of these shoals. So for these wild populations um, that I specifically studied, we do not know um, whether they're the age of the individual's fish. Um, what we do know is that, um, that these uh, rice paddies dry up. So I've got a rice paddy behind me. And so the zebrafish do disappear. So where they go, um, what happens to their eggs in, in the wild is, is, is a great question. Um, so yeah, th these water bodies disappear and the zebrafish will actually not be there. Um, and so um, whether that's the case for all locations, um, I think it's to be determined. Um, during the monsoon season, um, we do, uh, there's been sampling of zebrafish, but again, it's really quite hard because uh, the water gets murkier or more turbid and um, the water level is just really high. So it becomes harder to access them. So again, um, there needs to be more of these field studies um, on the zebrafish. We've gone mostly, well, I've only gone during the post monsoon season um, where they're easily studied. So yeah, th those are um, great questions to understand the, the, maybe the life cycle or the life history, more about the life history of, of these zebrafish. And your second question um, was, can you remind me? Sorry. <laughs> if um, population density is different between habitats with flow and without flow. Right. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So um, that's, that's a great question. Um, I, I, uh, that's a possibility. Um, we know in some of the uh, st uh, still waters um, that there are um, smaller numbers of zebrafish, at least that we can see. Um, whereas in the flowing water, there were just um, massive uh, shoals of zebrafish. But also in this uh, canal reservoir, we did see um, uh, we, we did see really large just quantities of zebrafish. They weren't necessarily in these large um, shoals, these that kind of covered the whole embankment, but um, 
yeah, I, I think that would, that's definitely could be population density could be playing a role in that. But in terms of, of food, um, yeah, I, um, there's been some um, evidence that maybe there's difference in predation pressure. So for these uh, longer shoals. So in our 2015 paper, we found that the predation pressure um, is potentially higher in these um, shoals that are forming these longer groups than um, these more loosely organized shoals. But yeah, there's other things that could be affecting them for sure. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, before, before I ask the next person to pose their question, please, um, one of the things we're trying to do is keep people um, connected. So if you could just state your name and where you're from um, so that people get to know each other, please do that as you ask your question. Thanks. Um, Zulema, please, you're next. Yeah, hi, Zulema Tang Martinez, University of Missouri in St. Louis. Um, Delia, I, I found your talk really fascinating and I have a couple of questions. One is with regards to the cadmium treated um, fish and the fact that females seem to have such much greater effects than males. And I'm wondering whether in the visual drum experiments, you found the difference between males and females that would indicate that females are, say, more impaired than males or vice versa. So that was question one. And the second one uh, is just a factual question. You talked about using a multimodal um, stimulus to test to see how the cadmium and water fish behave towards a novel stimulus. I was wondering exactly what that stimulus was. Yes, thanks. So um, when when I tested, uh, so, so I did look for a sex effect when looking for at the optomotor response or looking at the visual acuity, I did not find one. I did not find a sex difference in their visual responses. Um, but um, I should also clarify, it's not the females that are directly exposed to the cadmium that are showing the increased initiation of chases is actually the females that are in the group that are unexposed. So they're showing the heightened aggression. So um, I think what's going on there is that, um, is that the cadmium fish are altering how the other fish respond in the network and why would you say, why would you maintain, I should have added this, why, why would you maintain these kind of impaired individuals in your group, right? Um, well, you might think of, in, especially towards a novel stimulus. So the novel stimulus that I used was as an Eppendorf tube that was buried in the sand that we then, um, or gravel that we then um, um, raced. And so why would you do that? Well, you might think of it as like, if you're gonna go on a hiking or in the forest and there's a bear, um, you don't need to be very fast. You just need to be faster than the next person. So these uh, zebrafish might be doing the same thing with their, their cadmium. Uh, these unexposed zebrafish are doing that with their cadmium ones. And these, so it's, um, the females just might be more sensitive to, um, more sensitive to uh, the unexposed females just might be more sensitive to these other, these cadmium fish just coming closer because they just can't resolve their conspecifics or novel stimulus and they're re reacting more aggressively towards them. So yeah, it's, it's, yeah. it's the unexposed females that are doing that, yeah. Yeah, that's in some ways is even more interesting. It implies then that the um, non-treated females are able to detect there must be some change in the behavior of the treated females. And I'm not sure if this is what you meant at the end of your response, but I wonder whether the non-treated females, because they may not be able to see the other fish as well, are coming much closer than is tolerated by normal fish. I wonder if that could be part of what's going on. I think that's what they're doing. I think that's what, what you're seeing is that they are just, they're coming closer. You see it uh, to 
other stimuli in the environment, whether it's a conspecific or whether it's a, um, or whether it's a uh, landmark or whether it's a novel stimulus. And um, the un these unexposed females um, are not having it <laughs> and they're resp re responding more aggressively to them. So initiating more of these chases. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Okay, the, the next question comes from Eduardo. Thank you, Kirsten. I'm Eduardo Fernandez Duque at Yale University, Anthropology and School of the Environment. And I work with peer living and sexually monogamous primates uh, in the field and in captive settings. Thank you, Delia, for, for a very interesting presentation. I, and like Kirsten said, I really don't know much about fish, uh, but it, it's fantastic. It really got me thinking so much. I don't really have a question as much as I have something to share with you. Um, it's such a wonderful example of, of all we can draw from moving between levels of analysis and also going back and forth between the lab and the field for those of you who have model organisms where that is allowed. And I just, I don't know if you have come across his research, but I'm, I'm sharing with everyone the link to the lab of one of my colleagues at Yale, Antonio Giraldes, who is in the School of Medicine. Antonio uses zebrafish as a model organism for the study of autism. And so as I was listening to you, I had not really checked his website for some time, but of course, so much of what you're sharing with us has to do with the ability of organisms to tolerate each other closer or further from each other. And so he, I just, I mean, share the link here, but I'll be delighted to introduce you to him. They're doing all kinds of research, manipulating with pharmacological modulators as well to see how they can change the phenotypes of these zebrafish in captivity. And so it's, it's, it's I mean, there's so much more uh, that we can get if you can bring the natural history that you're doing and, and manipulating what you can in the field, but also learning, like you said at the beginning of your talk, learning from all these resources that people who are studying them in the lab at a very mechanistic level it can contribute. I mean, that, that's how we're gonna get the best possible understanding of social behavior where we'll really cover the whole span of approaches. So thank you, I really enjoyed it. And I, 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 I definitely can talk to you some more after we're finished with the Q&A uh, about Antonio's research. Yeah, thank you for that comment. I really appreciate it. In fact, um, so I've, I've now moved more into this uh, like National Institutes of Health, so environmental health research. And actually um, it's centering on looking at how pollutants can lead to behavioral disorders. So they underlie, so pollution might underlie behavioral disorders. And what you see is that um, people uh, that have elevated levels of cadmium actually show antisocial behavior. There's been a link with autism. So just to give an example, um, people in the military um, who have high, who had more demerits had high, had higher levels of uh, cadmium uh, within their body. So I, you, it's really quite remarkable that we're seeing this kind of heightened aggression um, in these groups, you know, um, uh, with these cadmium fish, and you're also seeing that with humans as well. So I really think zebra fish are, their amazing social behavior is really a, a good model system for some of these um, human pathologies that are induced by contaminants. So yeah, yeah, that's um, kind of my, my line of research now has shifted um, uh, for this K99, um, NIH K99 is looking at how cadmium, looking at kind of more of these mechanistic things, uh, how cadmium can lead to these um, psychological disorders. So yeah, for behavioral disorders. Okay. Uh, the next question is from Kaya Tombach. Hi, thanks for the talk. I'm Kaya Tombach, a postdoc at Hunter College in New York City, um, and I've studied zebras and primates. Um, that was really interesting, and I wanted um, my question actually follows nicely um, after Eduardo's comment um, because if I were visually impaired, um, I would probably feel more fearful or more cautious. And it's 
um, possible that these uh, impaired individuals kind of stumble um, around and by accident come into closer range of the other individuals, but you also found that they approached these stimuli um, more than the other members, which to me suggests that it's not just maybe impairment, but possibly also some kind of alteration of their inhi inhibition or fear pathways. And I wonder if in that literature on behavioral alterations, if there's any indication that that might be affected. Yeah, you know, that's, that's a great question. And um, I think in terms of the which neuromodulators are disrupted or um, is it's still to be uh, determined. So yeah, um, which pathways in the brain are disrupted? I, I don't think that's, that's quite clear. So yeah, um, we've seen heightened levels of aggression. And yeah, if you have maybe this antisocial behavior, which is seen in humans, might be um, an inhibition. They're just not, um, they're not tuning down their aggression. So yeah, or, or their responses to these other um, stimuli in their environment. So yeah, that's definitely a possibility. So yeah. Yeah, it strikes me that um, that could also alter or that could be a component of why these social dynamics are altered because if you have, um, you know, an unusually confident or um, bold member in the group, um, then yeah, they might be more annoying and they might be chased more but they might also be at, at times followed more if they're showing some kind of signals of con confidence or competence or dominance. Um, because of their behavior. We still have time for more questions. Um, currently, there are none in the queue. Uh, in the meantime, uh, Delia, I had a question. Uh, it relates more to the water flow part mm -hmm. of the experiment, the earlier part of the talk. Uh -huh. And again, I, I'm like Carson and Eduardo, I am pretty much naive to fish. So um, I'm wondering if these, you know, I think you showed a video, I'm thinking back where you showed the video, of the individuals that were like positioning, orienting towards the water flow. Yeah. And is there any, any evidence that kind of the dynamics that you were studying are similar in like um, social insects or birds that are form groups that migrate or something that where airflow is going across? Yeah, there's been some uh, relationship between uh, different systems and how they respond to flow. Um, even uh, humans, uh, when they form fel pelotons, you know, so there could be this hydrodynamic advantage that is is gathered by this orientation in this short, this, um, close um, cohesion. So to reduce drag. So I think we, we see that in birds and uh, humans and <laughs> um, yeah, other organisms too. So that, that are moved collectively. Yeah. yeah. And then I guess a, another question might be is, you know, I think Carson asked about predation. I, I apologize. I don't remember who did, but you know, if a predator is approaching this group, is there, have you thought about any of the potential effects of cadmium on responsiveness to that kind of stimulus? You know, that, that would be great. You know, I, I'd expect the, I, I'd expect um, for that, that you would still have these groups with cadmium individuals be more investigative of that. And I think the other members will be like, let's do it. Right. Because uh, they, the unexposed individuals, uh, are not going to be at risk for predation, right? They're going to be able to move faster or, or evade the predator because their sensory systems are, are more intact. So again, you get this, um, I think you, you, you would get this idea that you don't have to be very fast. You just need to be faster than the next person to be able to take these risks. So, yeah. So yeah, I, I, think, I think that's, um, that's one thing that, that would happen. So, yeah. Have any other questions? Oh, Cheyenne Smith has some from YouTube, it sounds. 
Yeah, hi, I'm Cheyenne Smith. I'm at the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga and Dr. Lauren Hayes lab. Um, my question is from someone on YouTube. Uh, first, I'm not sure who the name is. It's YK Rowe. It says, thank you for the nice talk. Oh, this is Claudio De La O from Latin University School of Physiology in Mexico. Uh, the question is, in what extent uh, can this result be seen as species specific? And do you expect to see similar collective behavior in other fish species under the same experimental conditions? Yeah, so I, th I think we see collective behavior in uh, many organisms. So I think my first um, picture showed you see collective behavior um, in bird flocks, flocks of birds. So you can see it in um, uh, ants. Um, Ian Cousin is probably probably most well known for these uh, study of collective behavior where he's seen it in locusts or um, uh, sheep. But I think um, the mechanisms may differ depending on, on the species. So some of them might be following these uh, simple traffic rules, right? Whereas others um, might have a director behind it. So yeah, I think um, each um, each system would need to be studied to identify um, if there are just some general rules that they're following or um, you've got these, these leaders or these key individuals that are influencing the behavior. So Cheyenne, was there just one question? Yeah, that's it for now. Okay. Yeah. Okay, then I, ne next in the queue is Karsten. Yes, I, I have another question where maybe I didn't fully understand it. Again, to the difference between skulls that are with water flow or without. If I understood right, in your laboratory experiment, you found that the um, skull diameter is bigger with flow. So the skull diameter is, oops, where's the camera? <laughs> Means it, it's bigger. Mm -hmm. But it, I thought, but maybe I, I've, I remembered it wrong. You said in the field, the individual distance in flow is smaller. So how can it be that it's smaller individual distance, the skull altogether is bigger. Is there a difference between the field and the laboratory or did I misunderstand something here? Yeah, um, so I think um, what's uh, going on is that in the lab we could control for group size, whereas in the field we couldn't. Um, so um, that's why the show diameters were so long because there's actually, um, more individuals in the group. So when we compared the domestic and the wild zebra fish, we um, just had a group size of six within each group. And if you noticed that um, the group sizes, um, if, if you noticed in that figure that the domestics actually, domestic zebra fish actually had a larger shoal diameter than the, um, than the uh, wild zebra fish, it's because the diameter is, is likely a product of their individual spacing. And the wild zebra fish are just more cohesive. They have shorter nearest neighbor distances than the domestic ones. So even though they both had a main effect of flow, they were larger in the domestic zebra fish because they had small, larger nearest neighbor distances than the wild zebra fish. Does that, does that answer your question? Yeah, I think my, my question was more regarded comparing your field study with your laboratory study. And I think you said in the field, because the schools were a few hundred individuals, you cannot directly compare it yeah. with the lab. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Uh, next question, uh, Zalema, please. Yes, hi. Um, uh, this is uh, more a comment and it's in regards to the question from Mexico about how um, generalizable these results may be um, other than, you know, specific mechanisms and specific behaviors. It, the question brought 
to mind studies by Tyrone Hayes at uh, University of California at Berkeley on, I think it's pesticides and their effects on amphibian populations where you can actually get uh, sex, it, they can change sexual development. Um, and in a, I suppose in a cascading form, those changes in sexual development so you can get going from a female to a male or vice versa, I can't remember the details, that obviously can also have subsequent um, effects on, uh, on behavior, on reproductive behavior and sexual behavior. And so I, that makes me think that results are generalizable in a, gener, in a, in a general way um, that uh, environmental contaminants have effects on behavior in a variety of different taxa and organisms, although the exact effects may not be exactly the same. The phenotypes may not be exactly the same, but I, um, I, it just made me think of Tyrone's work. And so I thought I would just mention it. Yeah. And I don't know if Delia has anything. I, I think you, you're aware of Tyrone's work. Yeah, yeah, no, Tyrone is, he's fantastic. He's definitely bridged this um, kind of this um, evolutionary ecology and ecotoxicology um, and looking at how um, these environmental features, which are contaminants, um, can alter uh, the behavior, physiology, and even the population dynamics of, of of amphibians. So he's, he's fantastic. He's got fantastic work. And um, speaking of him, I'm gonna actually, if since I, I don't know if there's any more questions, but I can, um, I can talk about um, just some things that I, I think are, are really important uh, to me and uh, important. Uh, um, I think that are important for the scientific community as we're experiencing probably one of the largest uh, civil rights movements in, in the US history, uh, second second wave of civil rights, rights movements. But I wanna talk about something um, uh, that's related to the uh, Nature article that, not on my research, but on my, um, that, that I wrote with a team of, of fantastic um, behavioral scholars as well. So, um, and I think uh, Lauren uh, mentioned it earlier. So let me see if I can share my screen. So first thing I can just share with you is that um, one of the things that I've uh, been doing uh, a lot is um, is commercializing technology. So I'm actually wearing my company's T-shirt, <laughs> where I um, was through the NSF I Corps or the Innovation Innovation Corps, where they um, take technology uh, that's been developed in the lab and um, to see if there is a commercial market for it. And so it's really taking academics to think like entrepreneurs. I don't know if you can see it here, but it's, it's VisioGlow is, is my company, which has taken some of the uh, technology uh, that came out of the Optimotor assay to create running wheels for, for trout to uh, look at sustainable um, aquaculture. And the idea behind it is um, that uh, there's expected to be uh, 10 billion people on this planet by the year 2050. How are we supposed to feed them? Natural uh, food sources cannot meet that demand. Um, so aquaculture has been um, designed for that. And I've created a, a running wheel for fish, which uh, helps with uh, helps reduce the feed conversion uh, ratio for, for fish. So it's also doing some of that testing and working with different farmers, um, largely in Idaho and um, Hawaii and um, in the South as well. Um, but yeah, so 
what can you do? How is this for you? So you could um, do it NSF I core or an innovation core, which is like Shark Tank every week. But it's probably one of the shortest grants that you will have to ever write. It's two pages and um, it gives you $50,000, you along with your team, um, to travel to do in person customer interviews. That might be a little hard for COVID, but you know, it's an accelerator, it's a startup, so I'm sure they've innovated. Um, so you do not need to have a technology, you just need to have an idea and a willingness to be trained and accept this, um, this kind of startup mentality. And so they provide you um, with uh, commercialization resource and teach you again how to think like an entrepreneur. And you'll um, think of things, there's different nodes around the country, but your university does not need to have a node. Um, they can just uh, participate this. And you do need to have a history of, NI, uh, of NSF funding. And oftentimes you can get that by having a member on your team who's had a GRFP or someone who's been on a grant and you need a team of three people. Um, but yeah, it's really fantastic training, especially as um, you know, the academic job market isn't very strong and people might be pursuing alternative career paths. So if you have students in the lab that would like to learn about entrepreneurship, um, this, this would be great opportunity. So um, the second thing that I wanted to talk about was, um, so um, a group of, of black scientists and myself published in Nature, uh, Ecology and Evolution uh, um, about recreating uh, Wakanda through uh, black excellence. And so um, this can only, uh, having a more just, equitable, diverse and inclusive uh, scientific community can only be established with you, <laughs> with you involved, you as scientists, because you were part of my, our community, right? So my community, all our, we're all part of each other's communities. And so some of the things um, that we highlight are, um, are, are how can you, how can you, um, science be advanced? And um, the simple things that you can do like today, like inviting um, people from underrepresented groups to provide seminars, um, to um, when you're discussing literature, um, discuss people from these underrepresented backgrounds um, so that it's integrated in your teaching curriculum. Um, and um, yeah, you wanna make it, you wanna give uh, plenaries, so make, uh, justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion, which I'm terming Jedi, so Wakanda and Jedi's um, main events. Um, you need to reconsider your uh, promotion and teaching, uh, promote tenure and promotion guidelines because um, there's a minority tax and most people uh, who are from underrepresented groups are, are presented or given most of these uh, Ta or tasks largely with uh, catering or, or helping these groups larger than um, other folks in the community. And um, so recognizing some of these outreach opportunities or mentoring or um, Twitter engagement, which is uh, science communication, which is la largely done by younger individuals um, as, as having an impact, right? And um, when you do your hiring, um, you wanna hire multiple people um, so that they can form these par partnerships. And I, I would stress that if you're gonna do things like cluster hiring, I, I know that's a big buzz term, is that you remove, you remove the choice from the faculty and give it to the candidate, right? So um, I went to Indiana University and they're notoriously, and other universities are notorious for doing two body hires, which is great. It's great for science, it's great for work-life balance, but that choice is with that person, right? So when you do a cluster hire, maybe you should allow the candidates to actually say, I, I wanna come with my friend. We have this great working relationship. We've gotten grants together. Like, can we come and be at your university together? So it's slightly different take on cluster hiring. Um, then um, you want to have displace, disrupt these positions of power. So um, when you're thinking of editors 
in reviewers for uh, journals, you want to have people from that represent the world, like you're representing uh, people in this talk um, that are from different regions of the world. You also wanted them on your review boards. You want them uh, to be decision makers, not just oh, um, not just as undergrads in your in your lab, and find support and funding that supports them. NSF and NIH both have diversity um, grants um, that uh, could support students. Um, and then um, funding agencies um, should uh, ta um, target these teams, not only in, not only should universities hire them, but funding agencies should look at people um, about what work they're doing and who's doing the work. And then when you're uh, creating your articles, um, when you're citing the literature as you write your papers or you write your grants, think of who you're citing. Are you citing, uh, are there two comparable um, papers? And maybe you should go with the person that has a different dimension that they can add. So are they um, LGBTQ? Are they a person with a disability? Are they from an underrepresented group? Are they a woman? Um, think about those things. So I think it makes for a richer, more diverse um, in engaging and maybe transformational scientific community. So yeah, that's it. Thanks for that, Delia, and I hope it, it can le lead to more discussions of these issues as we transition into the uh, more free-flowing part of the, of the seminars. Yeah, it'd be great to discuss. Actually, Delia, that's, that's something that, that your paper helped me, th helped me think about a little bit. Um, and so in, in my classroom, you know, I teach a physiology class and an intrabio class, and I had the students identify members of the BIPOC community that have, have generated science, you know, excellent science, and, and they presented on them. And then I finished up by showing, I think I told you yesterday, a TED Talk by Daniel Lee, who talks about mating systems and use hip hop culture to communicate that. And, you know, I thought it was really a cool way for the students to hear a different voice and to, to, to recognize the accomplishments of people that are represented in the field. Yeah, yeah, no, I think that's, that's excellent. I mean, like, how many, how many of you can name a black scientist? How many of you can name an indigenous scientist? Um, I'm sure you know the Nobel laureates, right? But can, can you name someone in your adjacent, in your field? Can you name five? <laughs> you know, so these are all things that I, I think that are, are really, really apparent, you know, um, um, to understand where where people are coming from um, and also where you're doing your work. I, I, it's really important to me because zebrafish, they, they think they come from Eugene, Oregon, but no, <laughs> they're in these communities, right? These communities in India. I think when you're reviewing, um, when you're reviewing papers, especially field papers, um, I think maybe there's even a reconsideration for authorship because I don't, I speak no language that where the zebrafish are native to. And so I've, on my field team, um, when I showed you that picture, we had to have translators, not just one translator, translators, because you could just move one state over and they speak a different language that you say it could be Hindi, but it could be a different dialect of Hindi and it could be a different language. So each region required us to have contacts and individuals that know the environment, that know um, where the fish are, because I tell you, sometimes the monsoons come in. I'm in the US, thousands of miles away from, from um, from India, and I don't know what the local conditions are. And my field team, uh, my collaborators, they're at one university, they're at universities there, but they also have contacts, fishermen or, or um, others who are, are within that community. And this is their land. It's not my land. 
I'm a visitor there. I'm a guest. So oftentimes I have to ask for um, permission, you know, um, and um, permission to uh, go there and, and study these study these zebrafish. I'll just uh, give you an example of what it looks like not only to be a a woman in the field, but um, but what it looks like to um, yeah, what 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 it looks like to be a, a uh, to do field re research with zebrafish. Let's see, where is this? Um, let's see, is that um, yeah, it's 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 very different than um, than than being in the lab. Uh, so you'll you'll notice here. Let's share this. Sure, sure, sure. So this this is this is what my environment looks like when I'm doing field research. What do you notice? <laughs> you notice I'm the only woman, right? <laughs> um, and this is a lot of time. Um, my sister is actually the one who took the picture, so she's the other woman that's that's in the fields with me. But um, if you look at the wild zebra fish literature, it's actually largely done by women. Um, most of our uh, a new rata bot is is there and it's developing all these different contexts. So you imagine when you're reviewing, this is the type of environment that that we're in. It took me two hour car ride followed by a 17 hour train ride and then another two hour car ride to get there. Um, and um, yeah, so th there's a lot. Um, and these are these are the communities. Um, let me see, show, share with you just some pictures. Um, these are these are the, these are the kids that you'll see there. These are the families um, that we interact with um, while we're there. They didn't care about zebrafish. They don't care about zebrafish. Zebrafish is probably a multi-million, if not billion-dollar industry, but it's usually largely in the Western U.S. Right. Um, but how can these people benefit is something that I've really thought about and using zebrafish as a biomedical toolkit um, as, as, in, as sentinels, you know, um, be, watching behavior is something that these people have done for, for a long time, right? And um, I, they can teach me and the scientific community a lot about them, but it can also um, do an exchange where you can use zebrafish, all these things that have been developed in Western labs um, to help with contamination events that they're experiencing, you know? So their, their families, their kids, their grandmothers, um, their um, people that we've um, met, you know, I've seen their, these are some, some of the kids that, that we see there. Um, and, um, yeah, some of the kids that we see in the environment and teaching them or learning from them about what's important to them and how some of them have lost their homes through to some of the monsoons. It's been drastically changed. So, um, but they can also show us wh where the zebra fish are and, um, and uh, lear learning from them. So yeah, some of these people we've I'm sure, as you know, as a field biologist, you've seen seen their their kids grow up and see the see them change. So I, th I think it's important to not only um, to give back um, from what we take. I take a publication that it's important for my training and my academic world, but what's what's important for for them. So yeah, yeah, that's our lady Phil team, Danita, Sierra, myself, and then um, she's a wonderful, uh, she's an auntie that's in the field that we, I've seen her since, met her in 2014. I see her every year that I go there and see her little daughter grow up and it's, it's great. So Delia, there's actually a question from Marin who related to diversity. Yeah, hello. I'm Maren Hook. I'm from the University of Derby in the United Kingdom. And um, I have been thinking about this topic um, recently because um, there's obviously also, um, well, 
I don't want to say pressure from above, but they, they are encouraging us to think about these kinds of things. And um, when I'm preparing lectures, for example, in animal behavior, um, I'm obviously thinking about examples. And recently I thought more about where do I pick the examples from? Usually they are either because I happen to know the study or because I used a another textbook and, and, and pick up the examples they give and then uh, try to implement it into a lecture. And I thought about, well, how can I make sure that it's not all Western scientists? I wasn't even necessarily thinking about what color they have because from the name I wouldn't necessarily know, uh, but where do they come from? And I, I wanted to find examples from um, first authors or primary investigators that are not from the US and not from Europe. And well, I come up obviously with a couple as a primatologist, I come up with a couple of um, examples from South America, um, but uh, African scientists, um, Asian scientists, apart from perhaps um, Japanese um, um, primatologists, it is extremely hard to find um, um, other South, South Eastern, um, South East Asian, sorry, uh, scientists or um, Aborigines from Australia. I would have no clue how to find them even. So what I was thinking was whether perhaps it's possible to create kind of a, a database of nice examples from various topics within um, animal behavior, be behavioral ecology, uh, where people can suggest nice examples from people with a more diverse background so that we can diversify the examples that we use in our lectures without, without making too much fuss about it. Yeah. Yeah, so you bring up a lot of lot of great points about um, who's who how how to get that information or how to find these people, right? And who who because right, I do believe people are are interested in making a more diverse and equitable science. It's maybe understanding how to do that, right, might be a challenge. Um, one one thing, and I think that we as scientists are capable, right? You all are fantastic scientists, right? You get all these grants, you, you know your study organism really well. I think you need to use that same amount of effort to um, making sure that it's as inclusive because you're, you're fantastic. Um, and applying that same amount of effort to making it more diverse and equitable and just um, scientific community is, is definitely needed. As far as color, I really think that the color of the person does matter. And I think it's important as uh, to, to showcase who that is because yes, they might be from the US. Yes, they might be from Europe, but what do they look like? And how does your, trans, your new student body, your new generation of scientists, how are they gonna identify with you? with them, right? Who, who does that look like? I think that's that's very important. The other thing is that, um, is how do you find these people, right? Twitter. I think Twitter is where you're going to go for it. I know you're not on Twitter, but you, you have to do it. <laughs> it's one of those things. And it, you can do it in multiple ways, right? And there's also listers because you say that we need databases, but they're created, they exist. You just have to be, that those communities exist. And um, I think that we as young scientists have to learn how the old guard um, does science. So do the old scientists need to, <laughs> not calling you old, I'm just saying more established scientists um, need to adapt and too, because innovation, right? How are we supposed to move forward? I talked about innovation um, with the NSF Innovation Corps, right? I, I think that that's what we have to do. Um, but yeah, these, these bases exist. And if you don't want to go on Twitter, Good thing that um, Nature has published a hundred or five hundred two series of five hundred Black scientists. Um, so there's another group that did five hundred Black chemists. So they they exist. If you want them in your traditional publication settings, there's an EEB Ecology uh, for women. There's one for URM. They, they exist, um, and there's 
just Twitter, I mean, there's just been a flurry of hashtags that have happened um, that, that occur. So yeah, I think there's, um, if other people have ideas, uh, ways in which they found it, but I mean, even just tasking your student with, can you find black science? Can you find five black scientists? Can you, can you find five LGBTQ scientists and make that part of their quals exam? Right, so their qualifying or preliminary exam, just like you do Tim Bergen's four questions. What's the new take on this, right? So can you find scientists that, that do that? Because um, Charles Turner, <laughs> Charles H. Turner, I mean, he's a fantastic uh, person who studied cognition and behavior in bees. I mean, maybe even before Tim Bergen. So in terms of some of his findings, but you don't see him cited you know, doing some of the similar work um, as, as these individuals, but not cited. So there's kind of this preferential citation of certain people from, from groups that I think if, if you really do a thorough literature search um, that in understand maybe the background about who's doing the science, right? What kind of person is that? Um, should we cite Lorenz because he's a Nazi, <laughs> you know? So sh should that happen? I think you need to really think about, um, he's not a Nazi, sorry. He had ties to ties to those groups, but I, I, I think uh, you need to consider that. I've put in a, a couple of references to papers that have come out recently, including some work by Zalema, which I'll, that's a nice transition because she had a question. So Zalema. Yeah, I was trying to unmute myself. Thanks for putting those up. I was gonna, I was gonna suggest those papers as well, Lauren. Um, I, I just wanna go back to a couple of things that uh, Delia said. If, if you look at Charles Henry Turner, um, Charles Henry Turner is an African-American um, who in 19, uh, I think it was 1906, if I remember correctly, he got a PhD at the University of Chicago uh, and could not find a job anywhere because he was African-American and universities did not hire African-Americans. Um, and the only university, the one that he had great, great hopes for had just hired um, another famous African-American biologist. And so Charles Turner, and they didn't have the money to hire a second one. And so Charles Turner ended up right here in St. Louis where I am. And there are actually high schools mentioned uh, or named after him. He, I would like to point out that in 1912, he was selected to the uh, St. Louis Academy of Sciences, which was unheard of at that point because uh, the Academy of Sciences were segregated and certainly the one in St. Louis was. So he was the only African-American member. He ended up working in a high school and in a high school with no infrastructure, nothing that would, no you know, collaborators, no graduate students, he managed to produce an amazing body of work and published uh, several papers in science and other leading journals. And this was long before animal behavior was even a field. So he was working essentially on the physiology of animal behavior in insects, learning, cognition, movement patterns, um, a whole bunch of other uh, questions on insects. And yet he is some, someone who has pretty much been forgotten. And I would say he was the first real animal behaviorist in North America, and certainly the first African-American animal behaviorist. And again, this is long before ethology, long before Tinbergen and Lawrence and so on. And so he's somebody that, that is up until very recently has been pretty much invisible and yet he is one of the pioneers in the field. Uh, the other point that I wanna make is that Delia, you said that Lawrence was not really a Nazi. Well, Lawrence actually, as soon as the Anschluss happened and the Nazis marched into Austria, the, in the next few days, Lawrence um, applied to the party and got his card. And that 
Nazi membership in the Nazi party, that card exists. And mm -hmm. after much research was actually found in the in, in archives in Germany. So um, yeah, I mean, that's a question, you know, it's a question that I think uh, it's interesting to talk about because there are other situations where you have people who have done amazing things. I mean, aside from his being a Nazi, uh, Lawrence was definitely one of the founders of our field and did fascinating work. And so how one balances those two things I think becomes really important. And what I decided to do when I was, I'm retired now, but when I was teaching and I would talk about the history of the field, I would not uh, whitewash the fact that um, Lawrence was a Nazi. Um, and I would talk about it. And I would also talk about his enormous contributions to the field. The other thing that's interesting about Lawrence is that even though he was a member of the Nazi party, later on in his life, he um, came out against fascism and against Nazism. So it's a very, very complex story. There's another paper in the same volume on history that Lauren mentioned, which is based on a symposium that I organized about Lawrence's ideology. Um, it's a paper by a woman named Theodora Kalakow. And I would really um, encourage people to look at that because it shows uh, the complexity of the whole Lawrence story about, yes, he was a Nazi. Officially, the Nazis used this ideology, but later on in life, um, he essentially no longer supported Nazism and actually lectured against it. But some of his ideas continued to be troublesome, at least to some people. So that's all I want to say for now. Well, I'm going to, at this point, I'm going to stop streaming.